All right. So welcome, Facebook world, to your <laughs> Thursday evening dose of astronomy. I'm Irene Pease here with the Amateur Astronomers Association of New York and kind of excited, kind of nervous to be on Facebook Live because I don't really know what I'm doing as usual. Um, that's not to say that AAA doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> it's just a learning curve. So hope people found us um, from our regular YouTube site and you're able to join us tonight. Uh, we have some exciting upcoming events to look at. So as usual, uh, we'll be using a couple bits of software to navigate the universe. We'll be using Open Space, which you can see in the background right now, and you can download it for free and use that uh, free to download at openspaceproject.com. It's open source. You can fly around the universe, go see Mars, track perseverance, all the fun things in addition to whatever you might see tonight. Also, we'll be using Stellarium, which you can find at stellarium.org. You can put that on your desktop, devices, what have you. And uh, we'll be switching over to that in just a moment. Um, so yeah, uh, again, uh, Amateur Astronomers Association of New York. We, uh, we have a couple of events going on. Uh, we have some meetups happening. We have classes happening. And stay tuned, see if we might get to do other live events, not virtually. Um, keep checking our main site, our observing sites. We're hoping to get back to some of that at some point. And so, yeah, keep looking up, but in the meantime, stay safe. So we'll go ahead and switch over to Stellarium and see what's up in the sky. Tonight we have, oh look, a moon. Uh, I like to magnify the moon in here in Stellarium just to give it uh, a little <laughs> more shape there. And turn around and look towards the west. Wow, it's not dark yet. Uh, so again, that's just the thing that we keep dealing with um, through the summer into the fall. But let's go ahead and see a little bit later, 10 o'clock tonight. Um, if you haven't had a chance to catch Neowise, uh, I think people are still finding it from a dark site. So go ahead and check that out. It's pretty great. And uh, tonight, um, I just want to check in on our challenge from last week. Uh, the moon is going to make it a little bit harder to see, but hopefully you've had a chance to kind of look up and try to find the summer triangle high overhead, that bright triangle, um, and find the space between Vega and Deneb. See if you can find that. This week you're going to be looking for a different constellation in preparation for the Perseid meteor shower. And there's some fun things that you can do with that constellation, um, but you have to get up like really early or stay up kind of late. So with the Perseids coming up, um, we are going to show where Perseus is. <laughs> um, you don't have to look at Perseus to see the Perseids meteor shower, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a bit. But here we're looking at, say, 1 a.m. All right, so pretty early in the morning uh, or very late. Uh, I guess if you want to see where it's going to be before sunrise. This is 4 a.m. So if you're really a morning person, you want to get up before the sun. Uh, Perseus is going to be higher in the east. But all soon people are going to stay up late because, you know, it's summertime. Um, so in the, in, the early, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, if you look up here, um, I always feel like Perseus looks kind of like this witch's hat. Like it's kind of like a inverted V or a mu or something. Um, another way to look for it is uh, if you can find the, the Big Dipper or the plow, whatever you want to call it, and uh, use the pointer stars in the Dipper to find the North Star. The Dipper is kind of low at that point, so if you don't have a very high, uh, if you don't have a very low horizon, it might be harder to see. But if you can find the, the North Star, and let's turn on these markers for us, uh, find the North Star at the end of the handle, the Little Dipper, and keep going, you get this big W shape. That's Cassiopeia, which is really great. Some fun stars and clusters in there, um, but kind of the lower bump of the M or W, depending on where it is in the sky, points down and it, you can tell it's actually right along the Milky Way. So if you're kind of tracking that with binoculars um, from a not so dark site, or if you can just see the Milky Way from a dark site, it's right along the plane of the Milky Way. So you're just following that down 
and uh, that's supposed to be a person holding a gorgon's head. Like so. <laughs> so a fun thing, uh, try and find Perseus. It's not the easiest constellation to find. Um, if you are up that early and you see this bright star Capella, um, if you were looking for Neowise in the morning, you might have been using Capella, this bright star in Orega, as a, as a marker. So you can kind of look between Cassiopeia, which is relatively prominent, and Capella, and in there, and a little bit south of that line, is going to be where Perseus is. So kind of a neat thing. So that's your first challenge. Find Perseus. <laughs> it's not super, super bright, but it is visible. So it has some brighter stars here. Uh, Mirafac and Algol, depending on its mood. So Algol is kind of a neat star. It basically is the head or the, the eye of this Gorgon. So you, you, I'll let you read the story in Greek mythology, you know, in all your spare time. But you can see there's this dude with a helmet and a shield, and he's holding this head of one of the Gorgons. She has, like, snakes for hair. Um, not her fault. Don't judge. Anyway, uh, she has this 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 eye that uh, that it blinks, so to speak. It's a variable star, so it gets brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer over the period of just a few days. So it's actually something that you can notice uh, if you're looking up in the sky and and keeping track of that, paying attention. Kind of a fun thing to see. So some mornings you might go out and say, "Wait, where's Algol? <laughs> I can't see it. It's too faint. Um, it's not going to get that much fainter, but but if you are noticing, you might see it get brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter. So that's Perseus that we need to know about for the Perseid meteor shower. So why is it called the Perseid meteor shower? Well, we have this kind of ooh <laughs> um, meteor shower feature in Stellarium. So the Perseids uh, are going to appear to originate from the constellation Perseus. So where do you want to look? Do you have to look at Perseus? No. Perseus doesn't even have to be up in the sky. Uh, but if you see a meteor shower and it goes streaking like this, choo, um, it's not a Perseid. If it goes streaking as if it had come from the constellation Perseus, then it is likely a Perseid. So I could be looking way over here in say Aquarius um, and maybe see something go streaking along here and if I trace it back even if it didn't you know come all the way from over here visibly if I trace back its uh, its apparent motion if that traces back towards Perseus that's how we know it was a Perseid uh, they do tend to be a bit brighter than some of the other shooting stars that you might see from dark sites we call those the we call this point the radiant so it looks like all the all the meteors from this particular shower are radiating um, away from this point. So you don't have to look at Perseus. You don't even have to be able to find Perseus. It's just, you know, a fun thing. Um, and But if you, if you do know kind of the general direction that Perseus is in the sky, basically this hour of the day, it's going to be in the northeast. Um, you can tell if, if, a, if a meteor looks like it came from that part of the sky or not. So I'll go into a little bit more of... Uh, viewing meteor showers in a little bit, but that's just one thing to keep in mind. You don't have to be able to see the actual constellation Perseus. So some people are already seeing Perseids even with, uh, even with it not above the horizon. So over the next few weeks, uh, peaking around August 11th, 12th, 13th, um, we'll be seeing more and more of those. So I guess kind of what's going on and then we'll come back and for once we'll end with Stellarium. Um, but let's switch back over to uh, open space and we're just going to check on this. See how we're doing. Um, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> um, so yeah, just checking our, our stream. I'm not sure how this is going, but I'm just going to hope that it's, <laughs> it's still up and running. <laughs> um, so for the, the shower here, um, we have, you know, starting at Earth, we're, so we're back in open space. And again, this is a software that you can load in at uh, openspaceproject.com. And you basically download 
uh, kind of a platform to load in and, and visualize all this data in, in three dimensions. So you can uh, load in different data sets or it comes with various data sets that you can take a look at. So uh, most of these are just the standard data sets that come with the program if you just download the defaults. And I think there might be one thing that I may have loaded in here separately or it might be one of the separate uh, scenes. But this is all real data that we're visualizing. Uh, if you go out into space, you don't actually see these lines. So these lines are just showing you know, the paths of the planet. So if you see you know, these big lines in the sky, there's something else going on. Um, those aren't really there, but we can use them as markers to help us find our way around. So I wanted to start off just with a, a little bit of NeoWise, again, for people that saw that. So there's this connection between comets and meteor showers. Um, and uh, it's basically, in short, so if you're, if you're tired, you don't want to listen to the rest of this, uh, the meteor showers are leftovers from the comets. This is stuff they left behind. <laughs> The end. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so we can look out here and we think this is like kind of the outer solar system, right? So we see the inner planets are like way in there. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And then we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And if you can see it, there's a tiny green dot somewhere. See if you can find the little Pluto streak. <laughs> oh, there it is. I don't know if you have the resolution, but it's, it's in there. So... <clears throat> We're, uh, we're going to go ahead and move out a little further because this still isn't quite the edge of the solar system as some people might define it. Uh, some people say, oh, you know, it's, you know, how far out does the, the sun's magnetic field shield us? So if you consider that part of the solar system or the edge of the solar system, then the voyagers have left the solar system, but they're not out here. So this grid that I turned on, this is the grid of where the Oort cloud is. We're going to call it the Oort sphere. That's its name in open space, open space name. <laughs> um, but there's this group of kind of asteroid-like objects that are really far out. This goes almost a light year away from the sun. So um, really far out there. It's like halfway to the next stars, basically. Um, so a pretty big grid, but we think there is a group of uh, comet-like or asteroid-like objects, just these big chunks of rock and ice in space, way, way out here, that are still just barely gravitationally bound to the sun. So when they are way out here, they're traveling very slow, they're very cold, and some of them might have uh, highly elliptical orbits that bring them in close to the sun. So instead of orbiting in a huge circle, a light year in radius, they might be, let me zoom out a little further, they might be way out here part of the time and then come in and zip around the sun, as we're going to see with a less extreme example, and then come back out here. So this is where the comet uh, Neowise came from. So these are going to be long period comets. It takes a long time for a comet to come from way out here, you know, like almost a light year away, to come in and zip around the sun and go back out. So those are long period comets that might only come around every few thousand years or more. So Neowise is, you know, we think it has a period of uh, six or seven thousand years. So if you didn't get to see it, you know, just, you know, a few thousand years, we'll see it, you'll see it again if you want to. Um, but much closer in here, we have uh, another group of objects that we do have some real data on. So the, the Oort cloud, all those little objects, those little comet-like things that were out there, we, uh, we haven't been able to detect those. So, um, so we, uh, that's why we just use the wire grid. They're very, very small, very, very far away. They're not bright. They're not stars. <laughs> they're not giving off light. So we don't have actual data points for them. So we can't visualize those. So that's why we have this lovely grid to show us where those would be. But for this other group of objects, they, we call them a couple different things. We call them trans-Neptunian objects because they're just past the orbit of Neptune, outer planet there. Um, or we call them um, Kuiper Belt objects. Um, so we say that basically Pluto, if you can see that tiny little green dot again, Pluto is basically kind of out there in the Kuiper belt. And this is kind of a massive data set. It doesn't break the system, but it comes close. It gets kind of shaky 
and um, I adjusted some of the settings so I can move around in here a little bit <laughs> um, without like crashing or not being able to reload. So the, these are actual data points. These are actual objects that we've picked out and we, we know their orbits. We know, you know where they are, where they're headed. Very exciting. And so, yeah, but they're, they're mostly way out there, again, past Neptune's orbit in, again, this Kuiper Belt uh, region of our solar system. So the uh, trans-Neptunian objects or the Kuiper Belt objects that are out there. And again, you'll notice some of these have different orbits, um, kind of like I tried to mention with the, with the Oort cloud. So some things just stay out here in a, in a huge radius, you know, just going around more circular uh, orbits. And then some of them are kind of not so circular, maybe not so regular, and might come in and, and get really close to the sun. So those are the highly elliptical orbits that are more stretched out. And uh, so those might get close to the sun and become these super fun comet things. So this is where the shorter period comets come from. So long period comets are going to come from way out by the Oort cloud, and these shorter period comets are going to come from closer in this Kuiper belt, which is still really far away, but it's a heck of a lot closer than the Oort cloud. So there is one small body in here. We can turn on the yellow one. <laughs> so I'm just going to blink that. Um, get a lot of data here. Um, so that yellow line, that is where we're headed. That is our comet Swift Tuttle. So you can see it spends some of its time pretty far out there. Um, and then it's going to come in and we're actually going to watch it and see its path trace uh, near the sun. So I'll turn off all this other stuff <laughs> that we don't need for now. Goodbye, trans-Neptunian objects. Thank you. And, uh, and now we can come back in here. So the, the date right now is set for March of 1992. And you can see, um, you know, those comets or th and those other objects, they're not necessarily like in the plane of the solar system. You know, they might go up above or down below, more so than the planet. So the planets are all kind of along this nice tidy line. The more massive things, they tend to be um, right along the ecliptic. But uh, this comet, the comet that gives us the, the meteor shower Perseids, which is why we're talking about it, this is Swift Tuttle, it's 109P, which means the P means it's periodic, so it comes around every 133 years. So if you didn't see it back in, uh, I guess it was early 1993, probably not going to see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Corey, if you live 133 years, then <laughs> you can see it. I'm guessing you didn't see it the year you were born. So, um, yeah, so let's go ahead and just play through time and see how this runs. Um, yeah, let's see if we can time. So off it goes. So it doesn't look like it's moving very fast. Again, the, the speed varies a lot. When it's way, way out in the outer reaches of the solar system, it's only going to be moving like slower than you walk, really, 0.8 kilometers per second. So it's not even going one kilometer per second. Um, but, uh, but here, when it gets close to the inner parts of the solar system, it's going almost 43 kilometers per second. So that's I, I didn't convert to miles, but you can you know look that up. But it just kind of goes whoosh around the sun. It doesn't actually whoosh. I just like to make the sound effect. There's no sound in space. But it just zips right around the sun, and, and then it slows down as it gets further away. So there's all kinds of ways you can explain that with physics using conservation of energy, or angular momentum, and other things that uh, I'm getting into right now. Just sweep that under the big astronomical rug for now. But yeah, it goes faster when it's closer to the sun. So that point where it's closest to the sun, that is called perihelion, um, meaning close to sun. Helion meaning sun, peri, I guess, yeah, close or close enough. So yeah, so perihelion, it's kind of coming in. It doesn't exactly cross, um, you know, super, super close to the sun. But the important thing is it, it, it looks like, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Let me, let me run time a little further here. So I'm just going to play time. It's play time. 
and there's this blue line that looks like it's, oh, wow, that blue line. Hey, that's us. That's Earth. <laughs> and it seems like it, it almost runs right by that yellow line. That was Swift Tuttle. So that's basically why we have a meteor shower, y'all. It's this intersection. So remember, when you have a comet, as it gets close to the sun, it's getting heated up. All this stuff is getting blasted off of it. All these little dust particles, um, some gases. You get this beautiful ion tail streaming out. So it actually has two tails, but it's the dust tail that we care about. So the dust tail um, consists of particles, and those particles are still moving. So remember, we saw the comet basically come came uh, kind of down. We're going to call north up. So we're going to say it's going from north to south. So this would be the north side of the Earth. This is the south side. Um, so it's going from north to south. And all those dust particles that got kicked off or blasted off at some point as the comet was heating up, they're still moving through space. They don't just disappear. They don't just stop. There's this thing called uh, Newton's first law. It's the law of inertia. It says they're going to keep moving. They're still being pulled on by the Earth's, or sorry, the sun's gravity. So they're still basically these tiny little particles kind of orbiting the sun all by their lonesome, but you know, with a whole bunch of other little particles, but they've, call, they've fallen a little bit behind uh, the comet that they, that they came off of. So even though we don't have that comet coming by every year, we still have this constant stream of particles that's coming down and intersecting our orbit, or we could say our orbit is kind of passing through almost like a waterfall of cosmic or comet dust. So if you imagine a waterfall of comet dust and the Earth goes plowing through it once a year, um, that's how we have this meteor shower. So I want to go ahead and go to today, buckle up, and we'll, whoop, there's today. <laughs> so now we're in 2020. Welcome back to 2020. I know, I know, I'm sorry. But uh, so now we're in 2020 and come in here and take a look at the Earth. And we're just going to follow the Earth into this into this waterfall. Um, so there's the Earth's, uh, the Earth moon. Um, and if I just go ahead and play just a few days at a time, we can see it coming in here and kind of get a sense of what's going on. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Oh, August 8, 9, 10, 11. Woo! And there we went. All right, so I'm going to pause it maybe go back just a day or so. So why do we have the meteors coming from a certain direction? Well, I think this, I don't know, for me this helps kind of show why they are where they are. If we look up in the direction of this stream, you see, all right, so if we're looking up in the sky, um, what constellations are up there? I don't know. Let's see, what constellations can we find? If I turn on just the, uh, the constellation lines, um, yeah. I don't know if anyone recognizes, ooh, Capella. <laughs> if we look up here a little further, there's, uh, there's that W or M, there's, there's Cassiopeia. And yeah, so we have Perseus there. So if we're looking up in the direction that these streams seem to come from, right, if we're on the Earth, they basically are coming from <laughs> this part of Perseus, which is exactly what we saw in Stellarium. So they come apparently streaming from this direction. Um, so that's why uh, Perseus is, is where the radiant is. That's where they all seem to be. That's like the source of our waterfall, um, our comet dust fall. And also, we tend to say that meteor showers are best viewed in the wee hours of the morning. So if we come in here, the part of the Earth that's actually plowing into the stream is on this side, right? If this is, this is the direction the Earth is going. So this is true for pretty much every meteor shower, right? So here the Earth is coming at us, right? If it's during the day, this day side of the Earth that's already lit, that's going to be early morning, that's not really going to be... Um, you're not going to see meteor showers during the day unless it's a really, really bright fireball. That has happened, um, but that's, uh, those are pretty rare. But if it's still nighttime, this side of the Earth is still slamming into the waterfall, 
cosmic, you know, sorry, not cosmic, comet dust. <laughs> and, uh, and so you're going to see all these streaks. So that's why the wee hours of the morning tend to be best. And granted, I mean, it's not like just one teeny tiny line. We didn't really show the you know, the full width of the stream here, because this is just showing the the trail of the of the comet that left this stuff behind. But um, all that dust, you know, it spreads out. So that's we have why we have several several days worth, several nights worth of seeing this dust uh, hitting our atmosphere and and leaving these beautiful streaks across the sky. So again, a lot of those particles, they're just kind of like grains of sand. They're not like huge. Um, but they're going really fast because remember we're close to that word that's going to be your word of the week perihelion where they're going uh, 42 43 kilometers per second so even something small going that fast eh, it's going to be that, that that's a lot of energy <laughs> so so we get these beautiful streaks across our sky so um, i'm going to go ahead and uh, pop back on over to uh to Stellarium and we do have a question <laughs> from Chris uh, how far to the future will we collide with Swift Tuttle uh, with uh, so Swift Tuttle it only comes around every 133 years and I guess looking at this it almost looks like it's inside of the moon's orbit I have a feeling it's it may not be actually inside of the moon's orbit um, yeah ooh, it is inside the moon's orbit but it, it should miss us so I mean we have we have a while um, so if, if we were actually to coincide, um, that would be, that would be, that would be a, a long shot, but, um, yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it gets close enough to actually like hit us, hit us. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something to watch out for, <laughs> I guess in, you know, thousands of years probably before the, it gets like, you know, close enough or whatever. Um, don't know the the exact period as far as like if it always comes by the same time of year guessing not if there's like kind of a little shift each year to get it a little further away um but yeah comets hitting us not too worried um and those like we would know at least an orbit or two in advance and we'd be able to do something about that so we have folks whose job it is uh, to, you know, look for those things, <laughs> keep an eye out for potentially hazardous stuff and, uh, and, uh, not let it hit us. So if we pop back over to Stellarium. Again, we have our Perseids and actually I do have, uh, I went ahead and found it in here. Um, Swift Tuttle. So, uh, again, it's 109 P. Uh, Swift Tuttle, search for that, and it's, yeah, it's below the horizon right now, <laughs> so um, it's way out there, if we look at, we say our distance, distance, far, distance, 40 AU, so that's way out there, it's it's in the outer solar system at this point, um, but, uh, and it'll, it's it's still slowing down, slower and slower, and eventually it'll kind of uh, screech to not quite a halt, but you know, a walking pace before it turns around and comes back to deposit more uh, comet dust in our path. So how to view a meteor shower. All right, so one, don't bother with a telescope unless you were gonna like take pictures of something specific. Binoculars only if you really wanna look for like star clusters and other stuff, but really the gear that you need to see a meteor shower, I recommend a blanket. <laughs> Um, because you don't want to just look at one part of the sky. So if I'm standing here looking at Perseus, fine, I can do that. But I'm also seeing the ground and I'm not going to see any meteors on the ground. So really where I want to look is up. So I want to see as much sky as possible. So you want to try and go somewhere where there's like a nice wide open view of the sky. But if you stand there, like trying to look straight up, like straight at the zenith, uh, your neck is going to hurt and your back is going to hate you in the morning. So bring a blanket or like a lawn chair so you can lie down. It'll be much more comfortable. You don't want to look up for just like 30 seconds. Uh, give yourself at least 15 minutes. Half an hour to two hours is, is best. If the weather is good, if you have clear skies, if you have a good horizon. Um, other things I recommend. Um, a friend. Bring a friend, maybe some music, maybe a beverage and or snacks. 
um, if it's going to be chilly or if it's late, um, if you get hungry, if you're hungry, stargazing isn't as fun. Um, but yeah, just keep looking up. So if you bring a friend, don't just talk to them and like look at them the whole time. Um, but like look up <laughs> at the sky. So that, that's the main thing, right? So if you're looking through a telescope, you're only going to see like a teeny tiny part of the sky. Same thing with binoculars. You're only going to see a teeny tiny part of the sky. Um, but you just want to look up with your eyes and, and try and see as much wide open sky, see as little of the horizon as possible so that you have as best chance of possible. Um, and then again, remember, if you see something streaking across the sky and it looks like it came from this direction where the constellation Perseus is, then it was probably a Perseid. And if it came streaking from somewhere else, that's just a bonus. It's not wrong. It's okay to see other meteor showers, or sorry, to see other meteors during a Perseid meteor shower. Um, but uh, yeah, again, the best time is going to be pretty late at night, early hours of the morning. And the peak this year is... Uh, it's usually like August uh, 2nd, or sorry, August 12th or so. And I'm just bringing up my clock again um, so we can fast forward through time. The one thing that we always look out for each year is, oh, where is the moon going to be during the peak night? So we're going to have uh, kind of a third quarter going into a crescent moon. So it won't be so bad. So if you want to try and catch it maybe just after the peak, uh, a few nights after the peak nights when the moon is more of a crescent, um, you have some time. But really, it depends on your schedule, <laughs> if you have to be up in the morning, and, uh, and the weather, wherever you are. So that's, uh, that's your tips and tricks for looking uh, out for a meteor shower. Um, <laughs> it, around the New York City area, um, if you can go safely into the parks, the parks close some parks close at dusk some parks close at 1 a.m so be safe um, if you drive out to some of the there's other parks out long island or um, they might be doing an event at jenny jump in new jersey so you can check out that um, but yeah kind of any any area where you can get to safely and uh, like lie just lie back like lie out on your car um, or if you can find an open field that um, that is actually public property. Don't trespass. Don't break rules. Da da da. da disclaimer: Don't hold AAA accountable for any of this. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I pretty much anywhere an hour or so outside of the city is going to be a bit darker. I have seen some from the city. It's a lot harder. So if you're able to drive just an hour or so outside of the city in pretty much any direction, it'll be darker. Um, and you can check the AAA website. Uh, we'll probably be posting more information, so keep an eye out on our website and, uh, and our social media channels for more information as we get closer and closer to that. So just signing off here. Again, thank you so much for joining me for your Thursday evening dose of astronomy on our new exciting Facebook Live location. <laughs> we'll still be uploading to YouTube, but... Um, Again, I'm Irene Pease with the Amateur Astronomers Association in New York City. Uh, check out our website, aaa.org. Follow us on the social media things, at aaadotorg. And if you like the visuals that you saw and want to see more or try it on your own, uh, you can download those for free at openspaceproject.com and stellarium.com. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Be safe out there and good night.